Uh, William Church, as you say, I'm the Sales and Marketing Director at the Jersey Royal Company. Uh, potatoes, the plastic's beginning to appear, so we know spring is promised, it's, uh, it's going to happen. What sort of uh, enterprise is the, uh, the company? How many people do you employ? We employ, it varies, but at the height of the season we'll be employing somewhere between five and six hundred people. Um, a lot of whom are seasonal workers who come in for um, a fixed period of time. Um, a lot of which is, we work with uh, people that come over, we've got a lot of returning employees each year and they will come in and work on a maybe a six week period, some want to come for two or three months, some for six months, some for nine months. Um, and so they come over on fixed contracts to work for us during the peak part of the season. My uh, particular interest at this time is looking at the conditions, the housing conditions, the, to some extent the employment conditions, but the housing conditions particularly of the employees in agricultural tourism, the, those people who haven't got housing qualifications, it's not just those industries. I've been concerned for many years about them. Does that in itself create a problem for your business? Housing is an issue um, because with the laws over here, these people that we have employ who come in for a short period of time, they're actually not qualified to go and rent places on their own back. But what we do is part of the arrangement is that we will also provide housing. So all of the people we bring over, we house all the people. In what sort of accommodation? Um, it depends. <coughs> the company, we run a couple of hotels. Um, and so therefore they are used for uh, quite a number of people. Are they run as hotels or is it uh, lodging houses? Or what? No, it's run, as, uh, it's run as a hotel, lodging house, uh, how do you explain it? We employ, the majority of our staff that we bring in on a seasonal basis are uh, from Poland and therefore in the hotels we, will, we do employ Polish labour to look after the hotels. So we've got um, a hotel manager who looks after all their needs and in the kitchens we employ Polish chefs so the food is all cooked which is the, the food that these people want to come and eat so everything is provided within the hotel we also do all the laundry for these people in the hotel so it is hotel style accommodation albeit they're not on holiday and could they live there all the year round if they were working for you all the year round? Um, it's we open the hotels for the peak part of it because, um, for example, one of the hotels we own is Lemma Road, um, which is the back at Longville, and that will house 200 people. Now, it's, we don't have that requirement all year round. It's quite expensive to run the hotel to have all the heating and everything um, in place. So we will open it during the busy periods and it's therefore not sustainable to have it running the whole year round, no. Your total number, I think you said 500-ish number? Yeah, of somewhere between five and 600. It can vary a little bit. It depends on the, um, depends on the requirement. If people come over uh, for a few months, you give them a contract for the few months or is it a week-to-week -week contract? Or? No, they're all on fixed contracts, so they are guaranteed a certain number of hours. Um, if, for example, last week when we had the snow, we actually didn't have any work to give the people um, because the, the, the land was covered in snow, so therefore we couldn't go planting. And equally, because it's so early in the season, we're lifting very, very small amounts. So there just was, simply wasn't the work. That said, we guaranteed them the, you know, a, a full week's wage that they were paid at, so they would get their um, 39 hours. So they're not um, transient in that sense, no. they come down on a contract. They know, they know that there's a guaranteed amount of money they'll be earning, earning in a week, um, but a lot of these people will come over and, for example, I, I'm aware that there are a number of people who will come during their holiday time from their job in Poland, they'll come over here. And so if they come across for three, four, six weeks, they come across and they want to work as many hours as they can because they're going to earn more money here and they then take that money back home with them to help support what a lot of them do is um, looking to build a house of their own back home. There was discussion in the States of Jersey this last uh, session about minimum wage and also what they're calling the living wage. Now Jersey has a very high cost of living. Uh, I don't know what a living wage actually would be, but the idea that people are paid a wage and it's not sufficient to live in a society is rather a perverse one, isn't it? So everybody, obviously, if they're working, in my perception, should have what is a living wage. Would such a living wage be possible within agriculture? 
It's difficult to answer that, and I think you actually need to go back a little bit in um, the history of how things have changed over the last, I think it must be, it's probably five, six years ago, and previously, which was also commonplace in the glass house industry when there were a lot of tomatoes grown over here, that the farmers would, as part of the package of employing somebody, they would give them free accommodation. And they would also provide tomatoes, potatoes, some other bits of food, and then pay them a wage. There was at that stage no minimum wage over here. The states then brought in a minimum wage, but at the same time they brought in a minimum wage, they also brought in benefits in kind, which actually, whilst it benefited the state's purse through tax, had a negative impact on agriculture. And the reason behind that if you allow me to explain, is because they also, and I cannot remember the, what the exact figure is, but the, it was then stipulated that if we in agriculture were to provide accommodation for staff, the staff had to pay for that accommodation and there was a minimum fee that we had to charge. So effectively, yes they were paid more money on the minimum wage, so let's say they'd been paid £3.50 an hour um, when it first came in and their minimum wage was £5.50 an hour, they then had to pay so much money each month back for the accommodation because it was a benefit in kind. So all that meant was it was a much, much bigger paper trail and of course it meant that employers in agriculture were getting an additional income for the accommodation that they let out. They were in, we then had to pay um, tax on it at the time. I know it's bought in this zero corporation but there was tax going that way equally because we were paying more money to employees, they were then paying a high level of tax. So it was a bit of a strange one. How we've managed to work it now is that yes, there is still a minimum charge that um, all of the people who come over and who work for us, they have to pay for their accommodation. And that charge that we put to them depends whether they're in, in one of the hotels, where they're getting all of their food as part of the package, they're getting all of their laundry done as part of the package, or whether they're in standalone um, accommodation whereby they've got the facilities put in there that they can live in a little holiday home as it were and they have to look after their own needs. Do they know that before they arrive? Is that explained to them? There is, they, it is put down as a choice and when we first took on um, using hotels it was not really viewed as, a lot of the people who came in didn't like the idea that they were going to be in a hotel, they thought it was a bit restrictive um, however, they are now one of the most popular places for people to go because we, a lot of the time, we employ married couples. So they come over for a short period of time, as I explained, some of them just for three, four weeks, six weeks. So they'll come across, they can then stay in uh, the hotel as a married couple in a, in a double bedroom. They have food which is left out, so they, they've they then make their own breakfast. So they've got a little fridge, they've got a, a microwave, and they can make their own breakfast. They have packed lunches um, provided, and then in the evening they get a, an evening meal which is cooked and ready for them. And if we're working later, of course, we say to the hotel, you need to cook and make the evening meal available at 8 o'clock. If they're not working such a long day, that evening meal may be available at 6.30. And so it's now become the favoured accommodation that we offer over here. Is that likely therefore you buy more hotels or is it? The biggest problem with it is the fact that when you take on a hotel it's a huge capital expense to buy the building and actually as in the case of Nemo, we bought a business so it is a hotel business however we've got a dispensation through the states that we can use it for seasonal worker accommodation in the way that we do which is great but as I explained previously, one of the problems with the hotel is it's great when you've got 200 people that need to be um, put up. However, during the off season when there's very little work going on, which is traditionally August is a slack month, August, September, we then have a bit more work going on for standing the seed in October, November. December there's next to nothing happening and then we start to have workers come back in again um, in January to start planting. And of course the biggest time is when we're still planting and we're starting to lift outdoors and there's a lot of um, labour required then. 
but there are periods of the year when we simply don't have the number of employees over here to warrant opening the hotel and therefore the, the cost of it, it's, it's not sustainable. The travel for these uh, people, I presume they're mostly young people, but they may, may not be, from, mostly from Poland, do you pay their travel from Poland or is that something they have to do for themselves? No, it's, uh, it's again, it's, uh, when we recruit the people, um, sometimes they wouldn't necessarily have the money to afford to pay for themselves to come over here. So we would organise that for them on the understanding that it's written in that they then pay for it out of the uh, money that they earn over here. So, no, we don't offer free travel, um, but we will pay up front and then they pay back so it's, it's organised. On my blog I've used the uh, reference to the porter cabins because it's quite an easy way of sort of uh, referring to housing in a bad light because it's got an emotive feel to it and at the last elections there was quite a lot of uh, states members, in fact all the states members of the senatorials condemned the sort of accommodation which is, uh, exists in agriculture and tourism for non-qualified people, yeah. that was what they were saying. Now it's quite an easy handle to take porter cabins, but your company uses porter cabins. Are they inspected? Are the, uh, the, are the standards maintained in those porter cabins? There are, again, in line with um, state's protocol, there are minimum standards that you have to keep. But I mean, actually, because we want the best for our employees, and so a lot of the time we are going over and above the expected, because. If you provide better accommodation and people are living a happier, healthier life, then they're available to work. Um, we don't want to have people who are in any way incapacitated through ill health, so we work with them to make sure that the standards are well maintained in any of the temporary accommodation that we offer. Equally, um, we have a team of people who are employed to look after the staff that come in. And so if somebody needs to go to the doctor, if they need to go to the dentist, then we arrange all of that for them. One of the ironies is that agriculture is supposed to have a, a degree of dispensation to be allowed to build accommodation for farm workers, agricultural yeah. employees, in the green zone or alongside farms, wherever required, under the island plan. But I attended a complaints board hearing last year where your company was attempting to build some proper houses at St. Juan's for, to house staff and they were refused permission and I thought that was a bit ironic that here you are trying to provide perfectly normal housing and yeah. it was refused for your staff. Is that a um, common occurrence that you would want to build housing and get knocked back, you can't build it, not allowed to build it? It's very difficult because planning over here is restrictive on occasions and so you, we need to work with the states um, on that. The particular site that you're talking about, had, when the Jersey Royal Company bought that site, it was an old, um, it was a business which had formerly been running by a, a gentleman who grew and exported um, glasshouse products. He was, a, he was a pepper grower. And when the negotiation was done to buy the, um, the small farm unit, there had previously been um, people who were employed there in and who had lived in port cabins, as you refer to. But it was actually the gentleman who owned that property before us who'd applied for, accommodate, uh, for planning permission to provide proper accommodation. And he had the foresight that he wanted to go and put um, brick built, you know, purple, proper houses on the land. So that was one of the attractions when we went to go and buy that site is the fact that we knew there was an opportunity to have you know, purpose-built accommodation for staff. And yes, it was disappointing that having gone through the process that we haven't been allowed to build there at the minute. The States currently is clamping down on the employment of uh, non-locals. They're trying to encourage local people to take up all the job vacancies that occur. Sure. And they're going to be revoking licenses for existing companies and in order that local people shall have <coughs> preference in those jobs. Would that policy, if it's applied to you, would that affect you very much? No, because agriculture falls outside of that. Um, we, don't have, we don't have to comply to the five-year rule. Um, and we don't have to apply for licenses, both agriculture and hospitality. Um, we can have seasonal staff come in to work, so that, that doesn't affect us. Uh, it, since most of the vacancies that occur are, you mentioned hospitality and those sort of 
uh, industries, the sort of activities. That's a rather strange policy, isn't it? You'd think that the locals would want to be encouraged into hospitality, wouldn't you? Especially, um, no reason why they shouldn't be like Georgia as well. No, I think a lot of that's historical because, um, as many people who are listening to this will be aware, that the going back over the last 50 years, Jersey was a real boom town for before um, transport links to other areas of the world were made so easy and so affordable is the fact that people would either holiday on the, within England and in and around England or the two places that certainly my parents generation if they were to go on a honeymoon really the two options was one they would go to Ireland or secondly they come to the Channel Islands and because of that Jersey, Guernsey was really known as a bit of a party town during the summer and there was a huge balloon effect where the population would double during the summer months. In Europe, places like Brittany, you traditionally agricultural area, but there are villages in Brittany which are almost depopulated because people won't work in agriculture or the nature of agriculture doesn't employ so many people. Now, if people uh, in Jersey would require a living wage, proper housing accommodation, would agriculture be sustainable? Would it be possible to carry on with agriculture? It's very difficult because the way that we are fine with the Jersey Royal as the um, principal crop over here is that there are times of the year where we need a lot of labour and there are other times of the year when there simply isn't a job available. So whilst there are some jobs which are permanent, there's a lot of seasonal work as well. So it actually fits quite well that we've got um, people who like to come in and work for a short period of time and that can fit in. It's difficult to say that, you know, local jobs for local people um, because it's not sustainable. We don't have necessarily jobs which are going to be 12 months of the year. The other factor is that a lot of the work that we do, manual labour, and it is quite hard work, and it's finding people who actually want to do that, whereas the mentality, um, which is also built into looking at the economical circumstances of those that come over here. They, these guys who are coming in from Poland know very well that they can come across here, they want to work the hours, they get paid well and they can take that money back and let's face it, if I knew I could go somewhere for three months and earn a good amount of money which I could take back and pretty much buy myself a flat, I'd go and work doing anything for three months. You're a young guy. Is, the, is there a profile for the, the average, the 500 workers that you have? Is there, are they mostly young? Are they? More, the majority are, yeah, mid, mid-20s, mid-20s to mid-30s, um, I would say, of the seasonal labour that comes in. So young, they need to be fit and healthy because it can be quite hard work when they're out there working in the field for eight hours, ten hours a day. Um, you need to be fit and healthy. So... Um, yeah, the, the majority of people we, we employ would be 20s, 30s. Yeah, there are two major companies, your own company and another company marketing uh, Jersey Royals. Are they, are they, their methods are basically the same? Do they have uh, similar employment problems or do they operate in a different way? Well, the other company who's exporting is um, only, it's a, it's a packing and marketing company. They don't actually grow themselves. They have a number of smaller farming units who contract grow for them, um, whereas the difference with the Jersey Royal Company is that we're farming um, 7,500 vergies, about 3,000 acres, and we are working with two, 300 landlords, securing land, and we then employ the staff and manage all over the island from St. Juan's right down to St. Clement's in the east. Um, we're managing teams of people to grow the, um, grow the potatoes for us. So, as a consequence, we're, a com we're, we're slightly different so far as we're a completely integrated company, growing, grading, packing, shipping, marketing, um, delivering product to... Would you markets. guess that that other organisation, their growers, uh, have, do they employ people on a similar basis? Do they bring in people from... Uh, Absolutely. And again, if you look back um, historically, before uh, um, Polish people could come over in, here and work free, when they weren't part of Europe, um, there used to be a lot of temporary labour contracts which were all organised through the Farmers Union. We no longer have to do that, so we have a team of people who 
do all the recruiting for us, which we do in-house. So we'll send people over to Poland who will go and do the recruiting. And we, we traditionally take it from a, um, a couple of towns, a couple of areas in, in Poland. There's many more things I'd like to discuss with you, but we're going to have to sign off. Is there anything else you'd like to say? I think we've pretty much covered it. Thanks for your time. Thank you.